Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, statutory lecture of the School of Celtic Studies at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies for 2017. It's uh, my great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Thomas Charles Edwards. He is one of the most illustrious uh, uh, Celtic scholars of our time. He uh, studied, he is presently Emeritus Professorial Fellow of Jesus College in Oxford. He read history in uh, Corpus Christi in Oxford and after he graduated he came to Dublin and had the great pleasure, I have no doubt, <laughs> of working for two years under the direction of Daniel Binchy. He then returned to Oxford and was research fellow there for a number of years and took up the chair of Celtic in 1996 and held that chair until 2010 when he retired. He is one of the most prolific uh, producers in the area of Celtic studies, early Irish law, early Welsh law, literature, history, language, and it would be impossible to, to do justice to his output uh, in his career, but I would mention three major works of his, uh, namely Early Irish and Welsh Kinship from 1993, Early Christian Ireland, a huge tome from 2000, and Wales and the Britons, 350 to 1064. His huge contribution to Celtic studies has been recognised by membership, fellowship of a variety of different societies, including the British Academy, the Royal Historical Society, the Learned Society of Wales, and he's an honorary fellow of the Royal Irish Academy. I said that he was here in the 1960s working with Daniel Binchy. I saw him first at a seminar in the 1970s in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, where he was working together, presenting a text together with Professor Fergus Kelly, who's also here tonight, on Bechfretha. And it was 1976, I was an undergraduate here, and we were encouraged by our Professor Quinn to go out to the Institute and get to know people. I can still remember the day I was sitting at the back, Pruncheus McConaugh, God rest him, was sitting up at the front, my teacher Gordon Quinn was sitting behind him, David Green was over there. If Liam Brannock was there, I, don't, I didn't know him at the time, I hadn't met him. <laughs> Rory O'Higgy might have been there, I didn't know him either. But I do know that Thomas Charles Edwards and Fergus Kelly were late starting. And Pruncheus McConnell was sitting in the front row and he was looking at his watch and turning around to everyone and said, oh my God, but you didn't say oh my God at that time. <laughs> And Gordon Quinn was playing music with his fingers on the table like that. And then it started. I told you they were doing Bechfretha. And Pruncheus McConaugh, if I'm not mistaken, started it. He went, <laughs> And the schoolboy came out in all those scholars. Gordon Quinn was soon going, <laughs> And David Green did, and I can still see Thomas and Fergus coming in, burdened with the weight of learning, carrying the big dictionary to a chorus of buzz from everybody. <laughs> Thomas's topic tonight is Early Irish Law and the Laws of Western Europe 400 to 800. Please don't buzz, but give him a warm tunnel welcome. Thank you. In 400, there was only one tradition of written law in the Western Roman Empire. By 800, numerous distinct written traditions existed from Lombard Italy in the southeast to Ireland in the northwest. <coughs> Across continental Europe, these remained in Latin. But in Ireland and Britain, where church law was in Latin, the laws of the Irish and the English were in the vernacular. 
This lecture will not survey them all, you'll be relieved to know, <laughs> but will pursue one central theme. How the stories, true or imaginary, told about the making of these laws relate to the peoples whose laws they were. I shall also take a briefer look at a second issue, what the form of written law can tell us about these laws. Legal process at this period, except perhaps within the church, was in the language spoken by the people. We have clear evidence for this, even in the case of written laws in Latin, from the technical terms introduced, which are often in the vernacular. And the Salic law of the Franks has a set of glosses, and these are in the ancestral Germanic language of their people. On the continent, therefore, legal process was in the language of the people, but written law in Latin. <clears throat> there was no such gap in Ireland and Britain. For the historian, the vernacular laws of Ireland and Britain offer easier material in this sense, that when reading a text a historian does not need constantly to be asking himself how legal text relates to legal process. There may well be a gap between any text and what happened in the on the ground, but at least in Ireland and Britain, we do not have to cross the barrier between two languages. To illustrate the help that Irish vernacular law offers um, on legal process as well as on text, um, it's worth taking a quick look at a particularly intriguing text, the short tract on the Arecht, uh, edited and translated by Fergus Kelly. The judicial assembly envisaged is a very grand one presided over by the over-king of an entire province, sitting alongside a bishop and also someone who may be a chief poet. It appears to be in the open air and to involve different categories of persons sitting uh, in special positions. And these categories of people are themselves called arachta. All those who may be required to give testimony are there. Sureties, eyewitnesses, and the like. But there are also others whose presence gave weight and authority to the proceedings. Not just the provincial king, but his uh, subordinate over kings, and yet others, Shanachi, whose function is to remember the past and to ensure that any decision taken in this assembly is remembered in the future. All these are there to support the central activity of this assembly. Legal argument by advocates <coughs> for the litigants in front of judges, followed by the verdict of the judges themselves. The final verdict, however, will be known not just to judges and litigants, but to the king of over kings, his clan kings, the bishop, the supreme poet, and indeed to all persons in the court. The judges are no doubt the experts in the law, but others add political authority to their <coughs> verdicts, and with that authority, communal memory of what has been decided. Early Irish law tracts, the written text, texts, um, are no doubt uh, the expressions of the expertise 
of the lawyers. But others added political authority to their verdicts, and with that authority um, came uh, you know, a sense that the whole community was involved in decisions. I shall now turn to some Latin laws of continental Western Europe and return to Ireland only later, towards the end. The earliest laws um, I shall discuss belong to the 5th century and to Gaul, the latest to the 8th century. The laws, however, that are initially easiest to approach are those that have a precise historical context. So I shall begin with one of these, which is the Edict of Rathari, King of the Lombards, promulgated in 643. Now this was the very same year in which uh, Rathari, at the head of the Lombard army, um, invaded and conquered the Roman province of Liguria. Rothari's capital was Pavia in the, uh, in the Po Valley, whereas Liguria was the coastal strip along the Mediterranean um, around where Genoa is now. Rothari's edict has a preface in the voice of the king which though it begins by naming himself <coughs> Rothari as the authority behind the law and giving the reasons for issuing his law book, it goes much further than that. Rothari, so he states, is the 17th king of the Lombards. His kingship is therefore ancient. He dates his law giving by the year of his reign, but also by the Roman indiction a dating method stemming from imperial taxation. And then by a third method, as the 76th year since the arrival of the Lombards <coughs> in Italy, when led by King Alboin, they were brought, so Rothari implied, or indeed stated, by the power of God from Pannonia south across the Alps. <coughs> It was God then that brought the Lombards into Italy as he had brought the people of Israel out of Egypt into the land that he had promised their forefathers. <laughs> During that migration, God had given Israel its law. Now, Rothari would renew the law of the Lombards. And this law would ensure that his subject could, and I quote, for the sake of fame, endure laborious struggles against their enemies to defend themselves and their lands. The link between law and warfare was made clear. The invasion of Liguria across the Apennines would further God's purpose in bringing them into their promised land. It would continue the task that Albuin had begun 76 years before. And the preface to the edict continues with a king list of all 17 kings, in which Albuin, the Moses of the Lombards, was the 11th. Quite how this was supposed to go down with the majority of Rafari's subjects, <coughs> who were Romans, one can only imagine. Were they latter-day Canaanites to be driven from their lands? <coughs> In the immediate context, they mattered little. Rothari had remembered how Albuin had led the army into Italy, and he would now lead the army into Liguria. The army, however, was Lombard, rather than Roman. Moreover, it has been noticed that Rothari gave a distinctly Lombard slant to his law, more so than later Lombard lawgivers, such as Jutprand in the early 8th century. 
In other words, he was more Lombard than he need have been. As a rallying cry against the Romans, Rothari's edict may have been an extreme case, but it was not unique. The origins of the law of the Salian Franks are much more obscure and probably go back to the 5th century. <coughs> but they were reissued in slightly revised versions more than once. One such reissue dates from the reign of Pippin III, the father of Charlemagne, and thus to the middle years of the 8th century. These were the years in which Pippin and his brother Carloman were leading regular expeditions into Aquitaine, <coughs> south of the Loire. And another name for the Aquitanians was Romans. South of the Loire were the lands that lived by Roman law. And though the Romans of Aquitaine acknowledged the last Merovingian kings, they were not yet <coughs> subject to the Carolingian mayors of the palace. The new issue of the Salic law was given a revised prologue, which ends with this sentence. This then was the people which being powerful and formidable in their strength, freed their necks from the harshest yoke of the Romans, and having accepted baptism, sumptuously adorned the bodies of the holy martyrs with gold and precious stones. Those bodies that the Romans had burnt with fire or hacked with swords, decapitated or thrown to be mangled by wild beasts. <coughs> War, however, was not the only immediate context in which written laws, laws were promulgated or re-promulgated. Another was conversion to Christianity. The best case is provided by the earliest English laws, those of Athelbert, King of Kent, which probably date from about 600, no more than three years or so after the arrival of the Gregorian mission from Rome. It is worth noting in passing that whereas in the two previous cases, Rothari and the Lombards in 643, and Carloman and Pippin for the Franks in the mid 8th century, law giving involved an appeal to the identity of a particular people. Athelbert's laws are different. They were for the inhabitants of an old Roman, a uh, Romano-British territory, Kent, not for the Jutes, the Germanic people that are settled in Kent, but also elsewhere. One way to gather a sense of the nature and workings of Athelbert's laws is by looking at how they um, they were expressed. I've long thought that a great help here uh, is a section of a book by Roman legal historian David Dauba. The title of the book was Forms of Roman Legislation and he picked out one particular form as characteristic of the earliest period of Roman legislation, the Twelve Tables. This was the conditional sentence. If someone should do X, let him be punished in such and such a way, or perhaps let him pay Y. The law here is in the form of a, of a hypothetical story connecting two events, the offence and the punishment or compensation that should follow. And through the second part of the sentence, it instructs the relevant judicial authority to make that same connection. If someone does whatever it is, 
the authority is to ensure that punishment, or it may be compensation, <coughs> follows. A further aspect of this ancient form of law is that it suggests a general rule, no one should do X, but it does not state it in so many words. Dauba then set out alternative ways of expressing a law. Instead of a conditional sentence, one might have a relative construction. Whoever does X, let him be punished or pay Y. <coughs> this established a category, those who did X, and a right way to deal with that category of person. <coughs> As for the way a conditional sentence uh, implied but did not explicitly state a general rule <coughs> of behaviour, here too there was an obvious alternative, namely to state the rule and give the sanction in different sentences. <coughs> Dauber's case then was that both these alternatives to the conditional sentence um, were tested later in the history of Roman law. Instead of a single way of enacting a law, there were now several. A shift had occurred from a single expression to a variety. Where this helps with the earliest English laws is that the same kind of shift from a single standard form of expression, the conditional sentence, to a variety can be seen as growing as we move from the laws of Athelbert at the beginning of the 7th century to those of later kings of Kent, Clothera and Iadric around 680 and Wichtred in 695. To this argument derived from Dava, we can add the recent discussion of Athelbert's laws by the American scholar Lizzie Oliver who was most unfortunately killed in 2015 when she was hit by a pickup truck when walking her bicycle. At Harvard, where she did her graduate work, her director of research was Calvert Watkins, known to all students of Old Irish. And she herself was teaching Old Irish as well as Old English at Louisiana State University when she was killed. Her book, The Beginnings of English Law, is quite first rate. But it also has this virtue for the topic of my lecture, that she is well aware of parallels in early Irish law. Historians of, English, of early English law, when they look outside the country for parallels, habitually look across the channel and forget to look across the Irish Sea. Oliver does both. She sets out several arguments for seeing Athelbert's laws as consisting largely of pre-existing law, itself in more than one chronological layer, and finally modified by the newly baptised Athelbert to give protection to churches and churchmen. Some of these arguments are evidently suggested by Irish parallels. There are also, however, major differences between early Kentish law and the Irish Shanachas Mor. First and foremost, in the Irish case, two centuries had passed since the main period of conversion to Christianity, <coughs> namely the 5th century. And the earliest <coughs> Irish vernacular law in, in the 7th. In Kent, however, the first written vernacular law followed within a year or two of the start of conversion. <coughs> also, when it was written, that conversion was very far from complete. Athelbert's son and successor, Eadbald, for one, remained a pagan until after his father's death in 616. The earliest Irish vernacular law then belonged to the 7th century 
and emerged as a written tradition or as a tradition within a textual culture several generations after literacy and textuality had taken root. Whereas in England, written vernacular law was there from the start. So Dauber's scheme of the development of legal writing cannot be applied in the same way to Irish law. Not only is it not, for the most part, legislation, but also it lacks the primitive quality of the earliest English law. There's nothing primitive about Irish law at all. For Appelbert's laws, we have the advantage of a brief description in Bede's Ecclesiastical History. This forms part of a summary of the significance of his reign um, at the point when Bede recounts his death in 616. Bede's description includes the following <coughs> crucial points. The laws were enacted by Athelbert, but with the advice of his wise men. They were in English, were still preserved, and were still authoritative in Kent. They began, so Bede says, with a law requiring compensation for taking the property of a church, a bishop, and of persons of other ranks, so that Athelbert might provide protection for the missionaries from Rome. Finally, Bede uses a phrase for the laws, <coughs> decreta judiciorum, which literally means decrees of judgments. Now this expression may seem odd until we realize that it neatly encapsulates two related senses of a single Old English word, dawn, modern English doom, used both for the edict of a king and the verdict of a judge. It fits very well the standard form of a dawn in Athelbert's laws, the conditional sentence, for such an edict only needs a simple modification to provide a standard form for the verdict of a judge. Since you have done X, you must pay Y in compensation. Dorm is an ancient term which cognates in several Indo-European Indo languages, including Irish and Welsh. <coughs> but in Old English, it has a particular resonance that gives us a sense of how the legal order rested on a social order. In addition to edict and verdict, it was also used for the reputation that someone had within his community, the judgment that others made upon that individual person. How important this connection of ideas was can best be illustrated by recalling the difference between homicide and secret killing, then called murder, the latter being much the more evil deed of the two. Theft and murder sought to escape through secrecy, <coughs> through furtiveness, the social control that was dawn, public reputation. And because of this link between theft and murder, the latter could be called in Old Irish Dunithaithe, person theft, stealing a person from his community. Bede and his Canterbury informants also seem to have been ready to conceive of external influence. For in a much discussed phrase, Athelbert is said to have established his laws juxta exemplar Romanorum, following model texts, presumably, of the Romans. What makes this particularly difficult, and actually 
probably makes one doubt whether bees have read them, is that we have good examples of barbarian law that do indeed follow the model of Roman legal texts. A particularly good one is the law code attributed to the Burgundian king Gundabad, but actually issued by his son Sigismund in 517. The contents of the code probably do belong to Gund Gundabad's reign, but their compilation into a code occurred under Sigismund. In that text, we have, side by side, enactments simple in construction and similar to those of Athelbert, but also others that echo in their wording, in their self-conscious rhetoric, in their explicit reference to the legislator, and in their propensity to set out general justifications the edicts contained in the Theodosian Code. An example is this. It is title 75, concerning dividing an inheritance between a grandson and his paternal aunt. <laughs> One, it is right that those issues that do not appear to be settled by earlier edicts should be distinguished by the justice of promulgated law, lest either heirs in this present matter should remain ignorant of the sequence in which they gain an inheritance, or it should appear that the judges should be without an adequate ruling. And so, if a son, blah, 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 on we go. Now, Gundabad had briefly been the head uh, of the army as magister militum, and thus the power behind the tottering throne of one of the last Western Roman emperors. It is not surprising that his laws should betray knowledge of the Theodosian Code. Nothing remotely like this ever appears among the laws of Athelbert. The only thing that is Roman about it is that they were written, and perhaps <laughs> that they were promulgated by ruler. <coughs> Lizzie Oliver presented a strong case that the bulk of his laws were constructed so that they could be remembered. <clears throat> they give us as good an example as we will find among these early Western European laws of a written text shaped by oral transmission. Whereas late Roman law was a product of a bureaucratic state with local officials to pose questions of law, expert legal civil servants to frame answers, and the emperor to promulgate the answers uh, as additions to a long tradition of written law, the earliest Kentish law comes from the earliest period of England's literacy, long before any bureaucratic modes of rule could even be contemplated. In its earlier oral mode, it was preserved presumably by some of those wise men whose counsel the Kentish kings relied on as lawgivers. An earlier text that in several ways stands between the Burgundian laws and those of Athelbert is the early version of the law of the Salian Franks. The Salian Franks were only one of the peoples that then made up the Frankish Federation in late antiquity. By the date of the law, it was the one settled furthest west, being separated from the other Franks by a forest, the Silver Carbonaria, that stretched from north to south, from what are now the southern outskirts of Brussels towards the Ardennes. Unfortunately, the date of the law and the context um, in which it was written are otherwise unknown. But the earliest version, I think, is likely to belong to the fifth century and certainly before the conversion of Clovis. 
it betrays no sign of adherence to Christianity. Indeed, quite the contrary. As I noted earlier, it is in Latin, but with vernacular glosses. The particular enactments, however, are grouped under titles, as in the Theodosian Code, so that to that extent, the organization of the text is indebted to Roman law. Although the earliest version of the Salic Law has no date and no precise context, a later version, which I believe to date from the end of the 6th century, and thus very shortly before Athelbert promulgated his laws, was provided with a prologue known as the Shorter Prologue to distinguish it from that longer prologue that we met earlier, written in the mid-8th century, when Carloman and Pippin III were hammering the poor Romans south of the Loire. Although modern scholars usually associate the earliest version of the Salic law with Clovis, the first Christian king of the Franks, who established his capital at Paris and thereby transformed the situation, um, political situation in northern Gaul, there is no mention either of Clovis or of any other king in the shorter prologue. Instead, the law is said to originate from agreement among the Franks, among the, in this case, the Salian Franks. Well, sorry, revised. By this stage, I actually think probably of more Franks. It continues by asserting that just as the Franks excel neighboring peoples by their strength, so they should excel them by the authority, by the authority of their law. And so they chose four wise men who derived from settlements beyond the Rhine, well to the east of the territory of the Salian Franks, who then came together in three judicial assemblies, discussed the starting points of legal cases and decreed judgment about each. This text fits most easily into a period when the leading Frankish king was from East Francia, for the shorter prologue speaks of the Franks as a whole, rather than the Salian Franks in particular. Franks across the Rhine to the east belong to the East Frankish kingdom, and the neighboring peoples who are to be impressed by the law of the Franks, as they were by its military power, were principally those to the east of the Rhine. Saxons, Thuringians, Alamans, Bavarians, and across the Alps to the south, Lombards. A reason why this prologue refers to the Franks as a people and to their wise men rather than to any particular king, may be that by this period there were two kinds of law among the Franks, the ancient Salic law and the edicts, generally called capitularies, of kings. <clears throat> the shorter prologue would fit very well into the reign of, of Hildebert II in the period when he was the senior Frankish king 594 to 596, namely the king who is likely to have given Luxeuil to the Irishman Columbanus, the king whom Gregory the Great must have persuaded to support a mission to the English, and a king who during the years of his hegemony as the leading Frankish king promulgated annual edicts for the Franks in annual assemblies at the beginning of March. How then does early Irish law fit into the background offered by this sketch of the early written laws of Western Europe? When these laws were promulgated by rulers, they usually had a specific context. 
A law in such a context frequently, but not always, suggested a conception of the people for whom the, lawyer, for whom the laws were issued. <coughs> um, for, for issued and sometimes actually a redefinition of that people. The first version of the Frankish Salic law was for just one people among, within the Frankish Federation, the salient Franks of what is now Western Belgium <coughs> and Northeast France. But when Pippin issued a revised version, it was for all Franks <coughs> north of the Loire as opposed to the Romans south of the Loire. It is not clear that the original Salic law was promulgated by a king. For one thing, even late in Clovis's reign, there, were, there was more than one king among the Salian Franks. But the capitularies, both those annexed in the manuscripts to the Salic law and those that are not, are explicitly royal promulgations normally in an assembly of magnates. In Ireland, the counterpart to a Frankish capitulary was the coin or rechtge. Coin of anon was promulgated in a great assembly, both lay and ecclesiastical. The sponsor of anon was Abbot of Iona and his cousin Lwingshech, who heads the lay list of guarantors of this law, was king of Tara. Iona, though largely Irish in membership, was within the lands of the Irish over there in Britain to the east of the sea. And the lay guarantors of the coin <coughs> included kings of Dal Rhyrda, and most remarkably of all, of the Picts. Yet, notwithstanding the fact that the scope of the law of Othernan extended to North Britain, the list of guarantors ends with and the intercession of all the men of Ireland, both laymen and clerics. This ambiguity between just Ireland and Ireland together with North Britain is worth remembering when we turn to the nearest Irish counterpart to the major laws of peoples on the continent, namely Shanachas Mar. Now, Liam Branagh, some of that, uh, has <laughs> rightly, <laughs> rightly pointed out that the old introduction to the Shanachas Mar framed this great law book in territorial terms as the Shanachas, the ancient tradition of the men of Ireland. He has also pointed to the close verbal links between the introduction and Chorus Beskny, a tract which he has recently edited and uh, which came at the end of the first third of the Shanachus Mar. And Chorus Beskny contains a version of the patrician legend. By the second half of the seventh century, this had become a foundation legend for the new Christian Ireland, as presented by the churches owing allegiance to St. Patrick. And the Chorus Bersley version has, has adapted the story to justify the place of a secular law in a Christian Ireland. The Chorus Bersley version of the legend has five participating persons, <coughs> Patrick, Leuchere, King of Tara, Dufthach, Makulukar, the poet, and Mahu Mak Uvoy, the druid, and Kork Makluikvech, ancestor of the Oanachta. Three of these, Patrick, Leuchere, and Dufthach, the saint, the king, and the poet, also appear in Murku's Life of Patrick. Whereas Chorus Besni has a single druid, both Murahu and Tirkhan have two, with names different from the single druid in the law tract, but also from each other. And Tirkhan did not include Dufthach, the poet. 
None of the others, apart from Coarse Besney, mentions Cork, the ancestor of the Oanach kings of Munster. The cast of characters common to all three, therefore, includes Patrick, Leuchere, and at least one Druid, but the differences between them show that, as Brannock has argued, the three are independent of each other. All three have particular concerns that are visible in the, in the tweaks that they give to the story, <coughs> and yet further concerns emerge in later adaptations of the patrician legend. One issue on which unfortunately we do not have conclusive evidence is the original date of the patrician legend as a whole. Daniel Binchy maintained that Patrick only became the apostle of all the Irish after the triumph of the Roman side in the controversy over the date of Easter. My own belief, hesitant, I hope there will be no kind of exocet from heaven, <laughs> <laughs> is that it was earlier and stemmed from a great change in the political structure of Ireland rather than specifically from the Easter controversy. But I must acknowledge that this belief of mine um, rests on other beliefs about the scope of Patrick's actual mission as opposed to the legendary one in Murakhu and the others. Those who do not share my understanding of the historical Patrick will rightly hesitate to accept my views on the legend. Put simply, I think it's likely that Christianity first gained a hold in the first half of the 5th century in a Leinster that then encompassed not only the province as known to Murakhu and Tirkhan, but also much of the Midland plain of Ireland north of the Lippi, from the Shannon to the Irish Sea. This was the Irish Christianity known to Palladius, sent by the Pope in 431 to be the first bishop for the Irish. The one specific topographical anchor that we have for Patrick, however, is in North Mayo. And his own confessio makes it absolutely plain that his proudest claim was to have brought the, Atlant the, the Christian faith to Atlantic Ireland to the far west. In modern terms then, if Palladius was a missionary bishop of Leinster, Patrick was a missionary bishop for Connacht. I also believe that Francis John Byrne was correct in claiming that the Inyeo originated in the lands west of the Shannon and from there conquered the Midlands uh, in the 6th century. If it is legitimate uh, to use a distinction made in the saga Fergus MacLeji and also at the beginning of the Shanachas Mar, there were three leading Kinela, kindreds, races, peoples, in the earliest Ireland that we can know through texts. The Leinstermen, the men of Ulster, and third, the Feni. Now the Inyeo were Feni and conquered the Midlands east of the Shannon from the Leinstermen. In the second half of the sixth century, they went on to assert their domination of the north by driving the Ulstermen east of the River Ban. The next step in the argument, however, I owe to my friend Patrick Wadden and I gather that he will set out the case in detail before long. So this is merely a warm-up for Patrick's <laughs> article. The kernel of the argument is that Patrick first became the apostle of the Feni, west of the Shannon, and only subsequently, and by means of their conquests, did he become the apostle of the Irish. This expansion of Patrick's role to encompass the whole island took time to work through. 
So Columbanus, in you know, the late 6th century, early 7th, remembered a mission from Rome, namely the one that made Palladius the first bishop uh, for Irish Christians in 431. But by the, fourth, by the 630s, Cumion referred to Patrick as Papa Noster, our bishop. And neither Cumion nor the addressees of his letter, Sirene, Abbot of Iona, and the hermit, Pagan, had any special allegiance to Armagh. This is related to a minor difficulty in translating early Irish legal texts. Some law tracts, interestingly not all, contain frequent mentions of such and such a rule being accepted by the Fenyi, la Fenyi. And this is translated, no doubt rightly, by such phrases as according to Irish law. The related term Fenachus, as Robin Stacey has shown, um, varies in meaning in different law texts, one of which is simply Irish law. Yet in a number of passages, Feni cannot be translated the people of Ireland. For example, in Bechfretha, a verdict is said to have been passed by the Feni and the Ullath, the Ulsterman. So the shift in the sense of Feni from a particular people within Ireland <coughs> to the Irish as a whole can be compared with the shift we have encountered earlier from Lex Salica as the law of the salient Franks to a wider conception already implicit in the shorter prologue and also in the edicts of Hildebert II in the late 6th century of Lex Salica as a law for all Franks. As scholars, particularly Maura Herbert, have shown, different conceptions of Irish nationality coexisted, at least by the early 8th century. One, mentioned earlier today, was advocated by Urugep Nanegus, was of a linguistic community, those who spoke Irish. And the term Goidil, Gales, was associated with this linguistic community. Another was in terms of descent, of the Irish, or at least of the free Irish, as a descendants of one ancestor. And in the old introduction to the Shanachas Mor, there was a third of a people defined by territory, the island of Ireland, and by common law, the ancient tradition, the Shanachas, that gave order and peace to the people and to their island. Here, the linked term for the Irish was Fir Ern, men of Ireland. Yet, in some passages in the Shanchas Mor, as we've seen, the Feni are not all the Irish, but only some. And in Chorus Bethany, it is striking that while Leuchere and his druids strove with Patrick, Cork the ancestor of the kings of the southern Feni, the Feni of Munster, although a hostage with Leuchere, was the first Irishman to bow down before Patrick. One strand within this version of the patrician legend asserted the claims of the Munster Feni as against merely the northern Feni led by Inyeo. In all the early European legal traditions discussed, Lombard, Frankish, English, and Irish, the relation of law to people or nation has been crucial. The context of a promulgation mattered. And since context changed over time, the relation of law to nation also changed. The Salic law, as we've just seen, was the law of just one Frankish people. Then in the sixth century, it embraced all Franks. 
and by the mid-8th century, the Franks in question came to be all those in Gaul north of the Loire and east of the Breton frontier, um, whether their ancestors were Franks or not. In Ireland, the change has been followed uh, in the term Feni, so that we've seen some law tracts within the Shanachus Marv are full of mentions of the Feni, in the sense of the Irish as a whole, uh, whereas a few, only a few, contain that sense alongside that of the Feni as merely one Irish people, just as the Salian Franks were just one Frankish people. Yet other law, law tracts rarely, if at all, use the term. With Rothari and the Lombards in 643, and the reissue of Salic law a hundred years later, we saw law in relation to war between peoples, Lombards or Franks versus Romans. With Athelbert in his law for the Kentishmen, war was not an issue, and with war a sense of our law, as opposed to the law of our enemies, was not, just didn't arise. The context was different. Conversion to a Christianity brought from papal Rome rather than war against Roman neighbours. The complexities of early European law offer a background against which to understand shifts and ambiguities in the relationship between Irish law and Irishness. The change from a law that belonged to one people within Ireland to a law that belonged to all free natives of the island had already happened by the date of the Shanachas Mar, but it had left traces. One such trace is when, at the beginning of the, large, of, of the first and longest tract within the law book, um, the legendary judge, Shanachar, the legendary judge and counsellor of Conqueror, King of Ulster, established the foundation of the law of distraint at a border meeting between the three noble nations of the island, the Feni and the peoples of Ulster and Leinster. And it's critical that it's a, an Ulster figure who's doing this as part of the mechanism for making it a law of all the Irish. Another issue was whether Irish law was solely for the inhabitants of Ireland or also for the Irish settled in Britain. <coughs> the law of Othernan in 697 was happy to shift between the two, referring to the men of Ireland and the holy churches of Ireland, but elsewhere to the promulgation of his law having authority over Ireland and Britain. And this is easier to explain, I think, if the Gales of North Britain still regarded Ireland as their homeland. As for the imagined context of the Shalakas Mar, that was like the real context of Athelbert's law, conversion to Christianity. This made sense since Irish law was undeniably inherited from the pre-Christian past of Ireland, but could be claimed to have been purified by Patrick working in combination with Dufthach. And this mattered since law flourished in Ireland in two traditions and two languages, the native law in Irish and canon law in Latin. And there was a creative tension between the two, as well as borrowings in both directions. Thank you very much. Thank you.